Hey friends, good evening, happy Monday. I hope you're doing well and having a fabulous day. Hey, I am excited to welcome you to our second to last class for uh, All In. Throughout the past semester, we've been exploring what does it mean to be all in as a Jesus follower. We, we looked at all kinds of different concepts wrapped, wrapped around that to try and explore how can we as followers of Jesus be all in in our pursuit of God and how can we grow to be closer to him. Over the last 12 weeks, we've explored a ton of concepts and we'll review those in just a moment. But I'm excited to see what's going to happen through each of you as, as you put to practice some of the things that we've explored together. Because I believe that God wants each of us to, to ultimately grow to mature believers who are radically multiplying our faith in, in the world around us to helping people run after God with everything we've got. Well, today, as we dive in, I want to begin, like I said, by reviewing the concepts that we've looked at so far and then land on specifically looking at, at the spiritual parent. What is the spiritual parent phase of spiritual maturity? How do we get there? What, what does it look like when we're there? And what do we need? That sort of thing. I, I believe it's going to be a fruitful conversation for us. Well, um, many of you remember we, we started off several weeks ago uh, exploring the concept of a disciple, a mathe taste. A disciple is someone who's an intentional learner who, who wants to follow exactly what, what his rabbi is teaching so that he can do and become exactly what his rabbi says to do. Uh, ultimately, they want to learn how to multiply their faith and, and how to take that to, to pass it on to others who will pass it on to others who will pass it on to others. And that is what Jesus labels all of us when he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men in Matthew 4, 19. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going to make you disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, so on and so forth. Um, what's interesting about the system, if you remember from the first week, is that God intentionally and methodically chose us. He, in the terms of the disciples and the, the original 12 apostles, he could have chosen anyone. He could have chosen the best of the best. He could have grabbed a bunch of rabbis. Instead, he chose a ragtag bunch of kids that have been passed over by the Jewish system, by the religious system, that were in trades. They were no longer in the, in the track to, to be re religious rabbis. God chose them, I believe, because God wanted to give each of us hope that it doesn't matter what our past is or what our present is. It, it matters what God calls us to do and that God intentionally picks each of us to run after him. It's not something that we can do on our own strength. It's what God can do in and through us. That's a powerful concept. Well, in, in terms of spiritual maturity and spiritual development, there's a, a phrase that I've coined, three letters, KBD, no be do. I believe that God wants each of us to know him mentally, uh, to, to have an understanding that he is indeed uh, God, Son of God, Jesus, and, and that as we grow with him, as we be with him, as we spend time with him, that, that we can mature. And, and that process of maturing leads us ultimately to doing the things that the Father has done. So knowing, being, and doing. I suggested it is the course of three phases of spiritual growth or spiritual maturity. Um, people are often stuck in one phase or another phase and to get jump started from one phase to another phase, from K to B or from B to D, oftentimes you need an external influence or external source. Um, one of the biggest things that we can do in the process of moving from K to B to D is simply employing the spiritual disciplines. And so we talked about spiritual disciplines and their role and their value from worshiping God to praying to studying the Bible to memorizing scripture, even to fasting, things like that. They're all vehicles through which we can engage with the living God. We can practice his presence, spend time with him, grow with him so that we can mature in our faith and ultimately do the same things that we see the Father doing in our midst. That, that phrase, do the same things we see the Father doing, actually is biblical. It's John 5, 19. Jesus himself said, truly, truly, I tell you, I can only do what I see the Father doing. We're each called to do what we can only see the Father doing. Uh, we've also explored, um, if you remember, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, therefore I beseech you, brothers, in view of his mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your true act of worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. You remember those, those two verses, they were foundational for us to understand what does it mean to be. Not only to know God, but to be with him, to spend time with him. We also talked about the Romans' road of salvation. The, 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 if you want a biblical roadmap to lead people to God, 
The easiest way to do so is the Romans road. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. That the word for sin is the Greek word harmation. It literally means missing the mark. It means falling short or falling, not being dead on center 100% of the time. It's actually an archery term. So if you think about someone shooting a bow and arrow, whoosh, and but when they hit the target, they don't hit it dead on center. That actually means they've sinned. They've missed the mark. They weren't dead on perfect. No one can hit dead on perfect 100% of the time. Everyone misses at one point or another. And the Bible actually goes on in Romans 6, 23 to say the wages or the consequences of sin is death. And so not only has everyone sinned, but the consequences of sin is death. But Romans 5, 8, good thing God didn't leave us there. The, the Bible says that God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And so that's the turning point for the conversation in Romans uh, to, to help you shift gears and say, well, God sent away through Jesus. As a matter of fact, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. And so you, if you want the Romans road, if you want a simple road map to lead people to faith in Jesus for, or a simple explanation of the good news, the euangelion, that's the Greek word for gospel, look at Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, and Romans 10.9. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty unique pathway to get there. We also looked, if you remember early on, uh, about the concept of a football field where you've got stands, a bunch of people in the stands, sidelines where, where a handful of people in the sidelines, and in the field where there's literally only a few people in the field. God wants each of us to be in the field. So many times we're in the stands, and in order to get from the stands to the field, we have to KBD. We have to know God. We have to be with him. And we have to do what the Father is calling us to do. As we do those things, it's literally like pumping spiritual iron, so to speak, to train our bodies and prepare our bodies for kingdom work, to do the things God has called us to do. Um, we, we talked about in terms of doing uh, the Great Commission from Matthew 28, where Jesus said, Therefore, go uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God has called us and designed us to be people who intentionally multiply our faith, who aren't just consumers, but who are active producers of, of what God has given us to pass it on to other people. Now, would, you, would it surprise you to learn that the, the people that Jesus was speaking to wasn't just the 12 apostles, but rather was, was a crowd of somewhere between 200 and 400 people that were hanging out when Jesus said those words. I believe that those words were meant for everybody, not for a few people, and we've talked about that. Uh, a couple more concepts I want to visit. Um, if you remember that that's the circle diagram we talked about, uh, the pathway of spiritual maturity, just like KBD is one way to think about it, another way to think about spiritual maturity is think about it in, in terms or in context of um, growth. Like a physical person grows from being a baby all the way to being a parent. So um, spiritual maturity can be tracked from being spiritually dead to a spiritual infant to a spiritual child to a spiritual young adult to a spiritual parent. And so you can trace the, the, the birth cycle or the, or the cycle of life for a, a follower of Jesus in that sense. Um, we talked about a couple of things that, that people that are uh, spiritually dead need. They need to be taken seriously. They need someone to listen to them and actually listen to what they say. And then they need the truth in love. Once they get those two things, they, they can be on the pathway towards spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. Infants in particular need a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. Children need space to grow and to learn. You know, adults need actually a lot of hands-on mentoring and opportunity for them to uh, put into practice what they've learned, almost like an apprenticeship. And then parents need kids. We're actually going to look at parents today and explore what that means a little bit more. And so as we shift gears and start talking about parents, before we get there, I want to do a little bit of a pop quiz for us because we've been talking about this, this cycle of spiritual maturity. And so uh, from one of the books that, that I've used as a source, they have this little quiz that helps us identify to see what skills we've learned because I believe we, we've learned a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. Clearly, is it's taken me almost nine minutes now just to walk through everything we've learned so far. Um, and that's just a small snapshot of everything we've learned. I believe we've walked through a lot of great content. So here you go. If we were to, to visit this quiz, I'm going to list off five different scenarios for a man named Caleb. If you think about these different scenarios, I want you to 
um, either jot down or even type out uh, in, in the description if you think this scenario describes um, Caleb as spiritually dead, as a spiritual infant, as a spiritual child, as a spiritual young adult, or as a spiritual parent. Because we're actually going to get to each of those phases and, and explain them all. So, first point. Someone invited Caleb to a home group where they did a Bible study and opened up about each other's struggles in order to pray for one another. Which category do you think Caleb is in based on him going to a small group for the very first time? For me, as I look at that, I actually think he's either an infant or he's a child, one or the other, somewhere in that, that spectrum. Because clearly he wants to grow. He's taking initiative for his growth. He's not being spoon-fed. So that might put him more in the child category, but he's going for the first time and he's learning one more tool for spiritual disciplines and spiritual growth through community. That's, that's also something that infants need as much as, as children need. So could be either or. Second example. An elder in Caleb's church invited Caleb to go through a new member study for 10 weeks right after he accepted Jesus. So he just accepted Jesus. Caleb has a lot of questions and the man takes time to answer them. Okay, so if he just accepted Jesus, what category would he be in? You guessed it right, spiritual infant. He's a brand new Christian, a brand new believer, and he's just trying to soak up as much as he can, and, and someone is being very intentional in walking with him in that early stage that's a leader in his church. Okay, third example. Caleb saw that the church needed help with the children's department, so he volunteered to serve there. Caleb saw a need, and he hopped right in. Based on that, what, what category do you think he's in? I actually put probably young adult, but maybe child, because it could be an older child that's, that's leaning towards young adulthood that sees outside of himself and says, man, there's a need, I wanna hop in, and I wanna volunteer and do that. That, that probably is where he's at. Um, now, I, there's two guys I want to talk about, a guy named Bob and a guy named Caleb for this scenario. So, a guy at Caleb's work named Bob sits down with him to listen to Caleb explain the gospel. Bob had never heard the gospel message before. Okay, so what category is Bob in? You're right, he's spiritually dead. He's not there yet. Caleb, however, is, is uh, either a young adult or he is a parent at this stage because he's, he's trying to share his faith with other people. Now, he could be a, a child. He could even be an infant because he's already heard the gospel. And now he's just passing on what he's heard. But because he's intentionally investing in other people, I would say he's probably closer to the young adult end of the spectrum. Um, but any of those answers would be correct. Last scenario. Caleb is now leading two groups of men in a Bible study about how to become more like Christ. He hopes that they will be willing to do the same thing with other guys when they're done. What, what category do you think Caleb is in now, based off of him leading two small groups and then actually hoping that they will multiply as well and jump out of what he's doing and do the same thing? You guessed it right, it's parents. Guys, you've learned so much in a short amount of time. I am so proud of you that over the course of the last 12 weeks, we have gone from from zero to, to incredible lengths of looking at maturity and spiritual growth and spiritual disciplines as a means of helping us connect with God and help other people grow with us. Um, today, we're gonna focus most of the rest of our time specifically on looking at spiritual parenthood, to look at what it is, look at some examples from the Bible and learn how we can apply that to our lives as followers of Jesus. I, I personally believe God wants every single one of us to grow to become spiritual parents. Sometimes there are little stumbling blocks that come in the way of everyone as they grow and towards maturity, and they get stuck in whatever phase they were in because they didn't want to move past whatever that stumbling block was, whether that's disconnecting with other believers, whether that is getting mad at some other leader, or, or they're just comfortable with where they are consuming. Sometimes people get stuck. But I believe God wants everyone to move towards spiritual parenthood. And we've looked at some of those examples for why uh, when we looked at the, the no be do, the do section specifically of that. Um, so if we were to define the concept of spiritual parenthood, I would say this. A spiritual parent is one who has grown enough that he or she lives for more than him or herself. He or she wants to invest in other Christians to help them grow. They're always looking for ways to volunteer, to serve, or help others around them with the intention of helping people grow in their faith and advance from one phase to another phase. It's not just volunteering for the sake of volunteering, but it's volunteering with a specific goal in mind to help other believers mature in their faith.
Now, if you think about some traits uh, of parents, you could think of physical traits like, like they actually they're selfless, they, they, they care about their kids, they, they want to discipline them as well, to guide them towards maturity. They, parents, actually, more than anything, they want their kids to succeed in life by graduating them from being children to being fully functional adults that can function in the world outside of them and being dependent on them. And so there's some sense of training and leaning towards that direction. Um, but parents are selfless, they're loving, they're caring, they deeply invest, they're forgiving, they're gracious in love. Um, man, a spiritual parenthood is probably the same thing. If I were to highlight a couple of traits as I see them for spiritual parents, I would say this, that they're always looking for ways to invest in others and help them grow for everyone around them. They're still themselves learning and growing, but they want to invest in others. They, they realize they haven't arrived yet, but they also want to point other people towards the same place that they've been growing and they've been moving towards. Um, they often pray for opportunities to invest in people who are faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable. Fat. They're looking for fat people. But, but not fat people as, as in obese people. People who are faithful, available, and teachable. So... Um, with that in mind, I want to take a look at two biblical examples of parents and see what's going on and see how that might influence the way we view biblical parenthood and, and spiritual parenthood and helping other people mature and grow in their faith. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 8. We're going to start there and we're going to look at two passages, one in Acts 8 and one in Acts 9, and look at what, what happened, what made this, this person a parent, and, and how that influences the way we view spiritual parenthood. So Acts chapter 8, uh, we're going to look at verses 26 all the way through to 40. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went there. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch and a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join the chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe this generation, for his life is taken from the earth? The eunuch said to Philip, I, I ask you, who is this prophet saying about this about, himself or someone else? Well, Philip, in verse 35, proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that very scripture. Verse 36, as they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Azostus, and as he was traveling and preaching the gospel in the towns until he came to Caesarea. Man, that is one crazy passage with so much good stuff. But here's what I want to take note to. Philip was, was available. He was praying and asking God for wisdom for what to do. God spoke to him and gave him very clear direction. So he went and followed and was obedient to that. One thing that parents do is that they're obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. If you ever feel like God is challenging you to do something and it lines up with scripture, it's something that you believe is going to help people, do it. Don't stand in the way. Do it. Especially if it's something that's confirmed with multiple sources. Um, if you're looking for more ways to understand the will of God, I highly recommend uh, Henry Blackaby's book, Experiencing God. Great tool, great resource for you. Okay, so Philip went to the Ethiopian. Uh, he went, followed God's direction, went to this chariot, heard uh, the Ethiopian reading a, a passage of scripture, and talked to him, initiated a conversation. Uh, and then I started explaining things to him when the Ethiopian asked questions. The Ethiopian at this point was not yet a follower of Jesus. He was a God seeker, but he was still spiritually dead because he hadn't accepted Jesus yet. Um, and so Philip took the time to explain what was going on to, to help guide this person to listen to what his needs were and then explain from Scripture the truth of the gospel to help him say yes to Jesus. He said yes to Jesus, and then he wanted to get baptized right then and there, and he did. 
Um, and so the spiritual parent took the necessary steps to help him begin his journey on the right foot and grow towards maturity. I think for each of us, the, the walk away point is we should always listen to the voice of God, pray and ask God for wisdom for where we should go. Number two, we should be available at all times for wherever God wants us to go and whatever God wants us to do. Number three, we should always help someone move from whatever phase they are to the next phase of spiritual maturity. Okay, next passage I want to look at is Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 30. This one's a little bit shorter, so let's take a look at it. When he arrived at Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him since they didn't believe he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and how the Lord had talked to him, how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He conversed and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers found out, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Okay, so this is a little bit of a different passage. This is our first introduction to Paul, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament. Literally, he wrote most of the books that are in the back of the New Testament. Um, he, in if you remember one chapter before in Acts chapter 7, if you're familiar with the story of, of Acts, um, Paul was, was a young Pharisee. He uh, actually was very zealous for Yahweh. He held the coats of everyone who was stoning Stephen. Well, he then went behind the scenes, went to the, the chief of priests and asked for a letter for permission to go to Damascus, just up the road. Damascus used to be the capital of Assyria, and now it was the, the capital, just another city in, in the province of, of the Roman world. But there were a lot of Jesus followers that were up there. And so Paul wanted to persecute those Christians because he believed that, that the... That, Christianity was actually a cult, that, that Jesus had just died and didn't rise from the dead, and, and so he was trying to persecute Christians, if necessary, even kill them for the sake of preserving Judaism. So in his zealous mindset, he was on his way to Damascus when God appeared to him, when Jesus himself appeared to him and said, dude, why are you persecuting me? That's crazy because Jesus appeared to him and then he starts conversing with Jesus and, and recognizing Jesus as God, surrenders to Jesus, has this incredible miracle where, where his eyes, he was blind, he's prayed for, he's able to see again, and he shifts gears. Well, he that happened in Damascus, he goes back to Jerusalem, and the 12 don't really know what to do with him because he was just literally killing Christians a couple weeks before. And so now he's in Jerusalem and Barnabas enters the scene. Barnabas, if you remember, from Acts chapter 1, was one of two guys that was up for potentially replacing Judas, the, the disciple who hung himself. And so it came down to Matthias or Judas. And if you remember from Acts chapter 1, they didn't pray about it. They simply threw dice. They actually cast lots and drew straws is basically what it is. But it was like throwing dice, saying, which one are we going to choose, one or the other? Uh, and, and the dice fell to to Matthias, not to Barnabas. Well, we don't know anything about Matthias from, from the rest of Acts, but Barnabas keeps appearing. Matter of fact, Barnabas was a major champion of the faith. Barnabas here ends up adopting Paul as if he were a son and starts training him and discipling him, taking him under his wing, becoming an advocate for him. He actually goes on from here and Barnabas travels with Paul on two missionary journeys and he becomes an incredible anchor for Paul to help mellow him out in some ways and guide him and help him mature in the faith. And so uh, as we look at him, I think what's incredibly important for us to learn about spiritual parenthood is that when we see someone who needs adopting, who needs some guidance, hop in. Don't be afraid to hop in and, and share with them, to start building a relationship with them and encourage them. Number two, don't be afraid to invest in them and, and think about a long-term approach, not a short-term approach. Literally, Barnabas probably had a relationship with Paul for something like 20 years. That's a long time to be invested in the life of someone. Don't think about it as a short-term investment. Think about it as a long-term investment. But don't be afraid to invite them along to do the same things you're doing in the process of doing that as well. I love both of those passages. And they're both great passages to look at spiritual parenthood. As we wrap up and shift gears here, I, I want to look at a couple of thoughts. First of all, parents, excuse me, Parents need people to mentor and disciple. It usually isn't hard for them to find people to invest in. They just have to look for those, those people that are fat, that are faithful, available, and teachable. 
Jesus challenged his disciples to pray to send more workers in the field because it was ready to harvest. Well, parents naturally pray for eyes to see and ears to hear what God is doing so that they can invest, and they naturally pray for people to invest in, and God brings people their way then. Uh, parents usually look for ways to help someone move from one phase to another. It's not just simply about investing in others, but it's investing with the purpose of moving them along. Just like that, that last example of Caleb, if you remember that little quiz that we reviewed, he invested in guys with the goal that they would do what he was doing. Parents embrace humility. They know that it's not about them. It's rather about what God is doing around them. They intentionally invest in others because it's about God's work, not their own. Also, parents invest to deploy, not to keep people at home. Um, just like physical parents, they don't raise kids so they can be kids that live in their home, that are leeching off of them the rest of their lives. Instead, they raise parent, they raise children, they're gonna go out. Our job as spiritual parents is to raise the bar for spiritual maturity for people who will go out and ultimately will do the same things that we're doing. Our job is to multiply, not simply just to grow physical bodies. There are some great resources that are available for us to use as parents. One is the Spiritual Development Guide that, that Pastor Darren, uh, Chris Matthews, and myself, we wrote. Another one is this, this book by Francis Chan called Multiply. You can also use the Bible and do like a verse-by-verse -verse study and simply just take time talking about it. Whatever you want to do, there, there's some great things that are there. And so I've got a challenge for us as we wrap up this week. Pray. Pray and ask God for one person at least in your life that you can invest in and help grow and spiritually mature. Because I believe God will help that help you highlight who that person is, and he'll begin you on the journey of helping to pour into that person to help him or her grow towards spiritual maturity. Next week, we've got a great week lined up for our final week together. I'm excited about it, but I hope today you have a great day as we gear towards wrapping up. Let me pray for us, and then I'll see you again next week for our final session. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for everything that you're doing in the lives of each of my friends that have joined us tonight. I pray, Lord, that your grace and your peace would guide us and direct us. Help us, Lord, to, to run after you and embrace you with everything that we have. It's not enough for us to simply just, just exist for our own sake. Lord, I, I know that you called us to be parents, and so I pray that you would help us to grow and mature in the faith so that we might be able to invest in others. I even pray that you'd highlight someone for us to invest in this week. Lord, I pray that you'd cover over each of my friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, I will see you back here next week for a final session of All In. Hey, blessings.